Good. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our UC Berkeley Extension Lit Quake reading featuring Thaisa Frank. My name is Liz McDonough, and I am the program director for the writing and editing programs at UC Berkeley Extension. And for those of you who may be unfamiliar with Extension, we are the continuing education arm of UC Berkeley. And we're really excited to be a part of Litquake's festival once again, but we're especially pleased to be in the Magnus Museum. Um, we'd like to thank them so much for hosting this event in their beautiful space. I hope after the reading, or perhaps on another day, you'll have an opportunity to uh, check out some of their amazing collections and learn uh, some more about their research efforts. Um, I did want to say before we begin, um, I just wanted to mention that we are filming this event for UC Extension. And so after Thaisa reads, we'll have a brief um, question and answer period. So I just want, did want to let you know that if you ask a question, your voice will be recorded on film. Um, your image will not, however. And please turn off your cell phones and put them on silent. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Thaisa Frank, uh, a longtime instructor and advisor to Extension's writing program. Thaisa's uh, sixth book, Enchantment, was published in 2012 and chosen for Best Books by the San Francisco Chronicle. The foreign rights for her novel Heidegger's Glasses, which we'll hear more about today, uh, came out in 2010 and was sold to 10 foreign countries. She is also the author of Sleeping in Velvet and A Brief History of Camouflage, both on the bestseller list of the San Francisco Chronicle and Finding Your Writer's Voice, used in MFA programs. She teaches in MFA programs for extension and is on the advisory committee for Extension's post-baccalaureate certificate program in writing. Please welcome Thaisa. Hi. Thanks, Liz, and thanks to the Magnus. It's really a wonderful space uh, to be reading this book in. And it's, it is my experience, because I've done a lot of readings, that the shelf life for listening to a novel is very short. So uh, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to um, read a, a short story that I wrote quite a while ago, which began, which sort of, you know, as a writer, you look back and you think of the things that have influenced you or evidence that you have been influenced. And I never really knew I was interested in the Second World War until a number of things happened. But uh, one of, uh, a story that I wrote sort of is a harbinger for that. And since it's a short story and requires very little attention span, I'm gonna start with that and then we'll read Heidegger's glasses. So this is called Poland. Her husband died suddenly of a heart attack right in the middle of writing a poem. He was only 38 at the height of his powers, and people felt he had a great deal more to give, not just through his poetry, but through the way he lived his life. His second wife, who was nearly 10 years younger, found the poem half finished moments after he died and put it in her pocket for safekeeping. His she never liked his poetry, nor did she like the poem, but she read it again and again as if it would explain something. The poem was about Poland. It was about how her husband kept seeing Poland in the rearview mirror of his car and how the country kept following him wherever he went. It was about fugitives hiding in barns, people eating ice for bread. Her husband had never been to Poland, his parents had come from Germany just before World War II, and she had no sense that Poland meant anything to him. This made the poem more elusive, and its elusiveness made her sure that it contained something important. 
Whenever she read the poem, she breathed Poland's air, walked through its fields, worried about people hiding in barns. And whenever she read it, she felt remorse, the kind you feel when someone has died and you realize you never paid enough attention to them. She thought of the time she'd listened to her husband with half an ear, and of the times he asked where he put his glasses and car keys, and she hadn't helped him look. After a while, she began to have similar feelings about Poland, a country she'd never paid attention to. She studied its maps, went to Polish movies, bought a book of Polish folk songs. Poland stayed on her mind like a small subliminal itch. One day when she was driving on a backcountry road, she looked in the rearview mirror and saw Poland behind her. It was snowy and dark, the Poland of her husband's poem. She made turns, went down other roads, and still it was there, a country she could walk to. It was all she could do to keep from going there, and when she came home, she mailed the poem to her husband's first wife, explaining it was the last thing he'd ever written, and maybe she'd like to have it. It was a risky thing to do, neither like the other, and in a matter of days, she got a call from the other woman who said, why are you doing this to me, Ellen? Why in God's name don't you let me leave him behind? There was static on the line, a great subterranean undertow, and soon both women were there, walking in the country of Poland. He was there too, always in the distance, and the first wife, sensing this, said, well, as far as I'm concerned, he can just go to hell. She said this pleasantly. It wasn't an expression of malice, and the second wife answered, I agree completely. It's the only way. Oh, here it is, thank you. Heidegger's glasses is based on something that really did happen, but it has a what-if quality. The what-if that you ask always when you're writing, what if this were pushed to the hilt? What if, what if? So the what, the actual what, is a little grisly. Uh, maybe some of you know about it. But there was, um, in World War II, uh, there was a male sort of decree called Operation Briefwachten. And what it meant was that prisoners, people coming to places like Auschwitz, just as they got off, often before they were shot. Well, it had to be before, but I mean, some of them were sent to the barracks. But they were forced to write letters to relatives saying, basically, having a wonderful time, wish you were here. Sign up. There's a lot of food. And the reason for this was many. Uh, it was to conceal the final solution. It was to assure relatives that everything was okay. It was also to encourage people to volunteer to go to these camps. And there, there, is, there are pieces of, un, of mail that show these letters, except uh, many people, of course, didn't address letters to the proper relatives. They addressed it to whoever, and it was returned. And also, as Germany began to crumble, the post service became very bad. And the result is that there were piles and piles of returned letters in uh, an office in Berlin. And so I thought, I thought, what if Germany thought it was important to answer those letters? every single letter that was returned from someone who was most probably dead. What if their belief in the occult, which was intense, I don't know how many of you know that, but uh, they believed fervently in the occult, and every month or so, or, or more, they would meet 
with, they would have a great white brotherhood meeting. And they would channel the great white brotherhood from the astral plane to ask it about the best thing to do about the war. And my theory is that, you know, either the great white brotherhood was kind of stupid or they didn't want them to win the war. But it was a big deal and um, I think it was Himmler carried a copy of the Bhagavad Gita in his pocket and of course Hitler in astrology and it goes on and on and on um, to very occult things. So the Germans believed in the occult. They believed that the dead could be contacted and often did in various seances. And I thought, well, what if the Germans believed in the occult so fervently that they were afraid that if letters to the dead weren't answered, the dead would start to pester psychics? And so I don't know how it happened. Somewhere in my imagination, I heard this woman talking to me from way, way down below the earth. And she was part of a compound of scribes people who otherwise would have been sent to camps, but who were roped in to answering these letters in the language in which they were written. And so the, the novel really takes place in this compound way below the earth, and it's somewhat fancifully decorated. Um, Goebbels was a 19th century romantic, and so I had it has gas lights and mahogany doors, and it's uh, in an abandoned mine. And so these people spend their time answering these letters that will never be mailed, that the Germans think will be put on exhibit at the end of the war as proof that there was no final solution. No one answered letters. No letters left behind. And. Um, Suppose there are these people there writing these letters, and then there's a glitch. And the glitch is Heidegger, who was a famous philosopher, who knows someone who presumably uh, wrote a kind of crazy letter. And he wants to find out. And at this point, the safety of the compound is destroyed. So that's kind of the idea. I have a map of the compound. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to read you two passages. And what I'm really most interested in is your questions, questions about record keeping, for example. Um, be before I read, I'll just say one thing that, um, that seems important, and I think important when viewing uh, the role of World War II and history itself. I'm not the kind of writer who researches in advance, but um, as I did more and more research, I began to see that there's something very novelistic about the Second World War, as there isn't in other holocausts. And I had to ask myself why. And I think the answer is a little interesting. Uh, for one thing, the victims kept meticulous records, and so did the perpetrators. This rarely happens in a genocide. It happens too quickly. Uh, neither side keeps accurate records. The victims don't even know they're going to be victims. But the Second World War had a kind of novelistic suspense, which was how soon were the Russians and the Allies going to get there so people weren't going to have to be gassed anymore. There was this great sense of suspense. And then there were these letter writers. And the letter writers who of course, were the Germans, and they embarrassed themselves into having to apologize. Uh, and uh, actually, I think many, many modern Germans feel terrible about what happened, because the records are right out there. But also, victims went to great lengths, great lengths, to record, and to record and then re-record. Uh, someone I know, uh, her father, had a very interesting job in the Warsaw Ghetto. His job was to be a kind of go-between between, between two factions in the Warsaw Ghetto, the faction of the ultra-Orthodox Jews and the faction of the less Orthodox Jews, and they fought. And the father uh, was not in that ghetto. I don't know how he got there, but he went there every day. 
and every night he came home and recorded what happened in two languages. One was in Polish, one was in Hebrew. But people also went to great lengths to code. There were elaborate codes that people who were far less famous than Anne Frank made. They made them because they knew what was coming and they had an incredible drive to keep a record. And for this reason, the Second World War, it was a terrible war, a horrible situation, but it also is emblematic of genocide and torture because somehow through all these records, through the suspense, we have a way to grasp it where it's much, much harder to grasp a genocide in Rwanda, say, where there's just a kind of craziness and people going around killing and getting killed and there's no time to prepare. So there's something in addition to, you know, the actual things that, happen, that happened that are important to remember for their own sake. It's important, I think, to look at the Second World War as something that isn't really over. <laughs> But it's something that we can grasp. Genocide is not over. Many, many things have happened since the Second World War. But there is something about the Second World War that's graspable. And in that sense, we have to be kind of grateful to the Germans for their records, <laughs> a lot of which were done on IBM printouts, by the way, in case you didn't know. And we also, of course, have to be very, very grateful to the victims to the people who kept records, to the people who cared enough to tell. So that's pretty important in, in thinking about World War II, I think, thinking about our endless fascination with it, our endless interest in it. And it was also a war in which people often fought and took great risks, but we know about them, whereas we don't know about so many of the others. So having said that, I'm just going to introduce you to the scribes. The scribes who live underground, who uh, are compelled to translate these letters that they know, or to write these letters actually in the language of the, of the letter writers that the letter writer used. And they are kind of trapped there. Otherwise, they would be sent to the gas chamber. Nonetheless, they have a kind of camaraderie. There's a sense in which they're family. And I think this is one of the things that, as, I, as they began to appear, kind of drew me to them. And I have to say, it's been a long time since I've read from this novel, but I feel always, every time I read it, I want to thank my characters. I want to thank them for showing up on days when I didn't want to work. So here are many of them. The chief scribe is Eli Schachten, who is a Polish Aryan who works for the resistance and uses the compound to rescue people. And she also is responsible for getting food and going on forays. And she's very close to um, Goebbels, very close to the Third Reich, they think. So she's arranged a feast. She's just come back from a foray. Within moments, scribes arranged 18 desks side by side and 18 more facing them. Ellie found candles and wine glasses in a room closet. A scribe named Parvus Nefissian set out pitchers with water from the well. Sylvie Nachgarten took the mine shaft to the forest and came back with pine boughs that made the air fresh and the desks into a banquet table. They brought out platters with ham and chicken and bread and cheese. Ellie lit candles and poured wine. Then she banged on a metal pot. Everybody come, she said. It's time for the feast. People began to appear from the most unlikely places. A short man in a skull cap and a taller woman with a long braid came from a tiny house at the end of the cobblestone street. A green-eyed woman in an enormous ermine coat darted from a corner. A blonde woman with a cigarette holder and an elegant man in a long black coat walked out of Ellie's old room. And Lars Eisenscher, an 18-year-old guard, 
who barely fit into his uniform, came from the mine shaft. As soon as Lars saw the man in the skull cap, he pulled out a seat for him and cut him a huge slice of bread. He sat behind him for the rest of the meal, pouring wine for him and the woman with a long red braid. Soon, 58 people were around the table. Lodenstein, the SS, who's sympathetic, had it at one end, Ellie at the other. The candlelight made faces float and plates glow. Everything was illuminated and reminded Ellie of an enchanted castle, freed from a spell. She stood up and raised her wine glass. To the end of the war, she said, to victory for the Allies. The room was filled with the sound of clinking glasses. People passed platters and joked about the best word for bread in different languages. Pain is best, said a woman, the woman in the ermine coat. As soon as you say it, you see a baguette with butter. Brot is better, said Parvis in Piscean. As soon as you say it, you see soup. Who cares, said the tall man in the black coat. What we need is a mazurka. And he grabbed the blonde woman and began to dance. Above, in the shoebox of a watchtower, a man with a large face and, ch and several chins leaned against the glass. He seemed weighted by his chins, trapped in a different element, and looked forlorn. Ellie shocked and nodded to Lars, who left the table and went up the winding stairs to the watchtower. Soon, the heavy man was sitting next to Ellie. She patted his arm and filled his plate with food. The woman in the ermine coat poured him wine. To each and every one of us, said Ellie, tapping her wine glass. To all of us in the compound, said Lodenstein, standing up. Over 20 scribes touched glasses with the heavy man. He was surrounded by arched backs, bowed head, curved arms. The sound of glasses filled the room like bells. To victory, he said under his breath. So we got our villain in. And um, the counterpoint did a really great job on this book. They, they had the letters uh, on separate pages to look like letters in the original language. And every one of them had a certain kind of handwriting, different handwriting. So when I got the, when I got the galleys, I thought, my god. Did they really do all of this by hand? But it turns out you can set letters. So I'm just going to read you um, a small section about uh, Auschwitz. Uh, it's about somebody who was in Auschwitz who is of great interest to Martin Heidegger. And his name is Asher Engelhardt. He taught philosophy with Heidegger uh, at Freiburg. And then, of course, he was barred because he was a Jew. And he began to be an optrician, which is really why it's called Heidegger's glasses. So the optrician is at Auschwitz. And he's been pulled from heavy labor because of an order triggered by Heidegger. And now he is the optician for the officers. The room in the officer's clinic was like Osher's shop in Freiburg, shrunk to a fourth of its original size. In this miniature version of his old room, he saw an optometrist chair, an illuminated eye chart with Gothic letters, and tools for grinding lenses. A man with a green armband was cleaning instruments and said he would be his assistant since he knew how to weld frames. Asher still wondered if he were about to be killed. But after two days, he didn't care, because life was a little more bearable. After morning roll call, a guard walked in through the snow to the warm, quiet halls of the officer's clinic. Every time Asher opened the door, he thought he might find Mengele and instruments of torture. But he always found the optometrist room, calm, quiet, efficient. The officers who came for glasses answered questions politely. So politely, Asher forgot he was a prisoner. He was pulled from heavy labor in mid-February, and a few mornings later, he looked from the window 
of his workroom to a snow that covered everything and a bridal veil of white. Even the rune-like barbed wire fences and the corpses that hung from them like sheets. By noon, there was a shooting, and a red stain bloomed in the snow. The stain faded to pink, and by dust, it was a rust-colored blotch. A few days later, there was another snowfall veiling the camp in white all over again. It occurred to Asher, not without irony, that as long as there was snow, whatever happened in Auschwitz was reversible. He liked looking from the pane window of his workroom. The snow reminded him of winter childhoods when he played with his sister, who'd been smart enough to move to America. It had been a time when the woods were safe for children, and they believed in snow maidens who came to life and wolves that could grant wishes. He and his sister had lain in the snow, waved their hands, and left imprints that looked like angels. So that's all I'm going to read for the moment. I can always be persuaded to read more, but I'm really more interested in, in any questions you have or experiences you've had with people who actually were in the Second World War or kids who were survivors of people in the Second World War. And I'm happy to answer questions about how the characters were put together and anything else. How can anyone deny the Holocaust with all this evidence in front of us? Well, people deny a lot of things with a lot of evidence in front of them. I think it's a part of human nature. I haven't had a chance yet to read your book, but I really am interested in how you develop the characters. Were any of the characters taken from survivors that you had an opportunity to meet or work with? Well, that's interesting, and yes, and in a way, yes. Um, I actually became interested in the Second World War when I, or aware of it, I would say, when I lived in New York in my 20s. Um, I lived in Manhattan for quite a while. And I'd really, no one ever talked about the Holocaust. I'm a, I was a bicultural child. My, one of my grandfathers was a famous Presbyterian theologian, and the other was an escaped Hasid from Romania, an ex-Hasid, I would add. And they even talked to each other and uh, talked about Aramaic texts. So it was an interesting background, but no one ever mentioned the Holocaust. And when I lived in New York in my 20s, I began to notice people with blue numbers on their arm. There were still people who, many people, who had those numbers. Um, <clears throat> and there was one incident in particular that was really, I'm sure it was far more seminal than I even know. I'm sure that that was one of the beginnings of the book uh, many years ago. Um, <clears throat> There was a typewriter repairman named Stanley Edelman. And Stanley Edelman had a typewriter store in Amsterdam. And one very hot summer day in my 20s, when I was in the middle of a terrible love affair, and I was in that 20 craziness. I mean, I couldn't think of anything, really. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't follow a recipe. <laughs> my typewriter broke. And I brought it to the store. I somehow chose it. And um, the guy there, uh, Stanley Edelman, had these amazing, piercing blue eyes. They just were like they fixed on me. And he began to explain to me exactly what was wrong with my typewriter. But I couldn't follow him. I was 20, I was crazy, you know, it was a hot summer day. I, I wasn't going to the Hamptons like everybody else. And he saw that I didn't understand and he explained and explained and explained as if it were the most urgent matter in the world, as if we were across a barbed wire fence and he was giving me rescue operations until I understood, until he penetrated all of my chaotic, hysterical craziness, and I understood how my typewriter worked. 
And as um, I talked to him, I noticed blue numbers on his arm. And we became friends, uh, but only when I saw his obit in the Times did I realize that he was the repairman for every writer in New York City. Philip Roth, Ivy Singer, Cheever, he was the writer's repairman, and I wasn't even, I, you know, I'd written as a kid, and I was kind of jettisoning writing. I wasn't interested, but I was kind of still a writer, you know. And so that's who I brought my typewriter to, and that's who I became friends with, and that's who got me to understand my typewriter. And he must have been young when he went to Auschwitz, but he had a kind of penetrating consciousness and sense of urgency about communication that I never forgot. And in the write-up in the Times, in his obit, uh, he, he did things like explain to a Jewish writer why a German typewriter was still best for him. He was, and I bet he, he made his point. So uh, he was definitely on my mind, and the main character is Ashel Engelhardt, which is a little like Stanley Edelman, although Engel means angel and heart means heart, the heart of an angel. But this is a fascinating book because what it generally has is diaries and then German decrees. So you get the sense of being in the Lotz ghetto. Um, the Lotz ghetto was an interesting ghetto. Like some ghettos, it had a head of the ghetto who was Jewish. And I'm not going to bother you. But they, the, the head of the ghetto was Jewish. And that was a really dirty game that you know people played in order to save their own lives. But he would decide he would be deported. Uh, he lived very well um, for that time. Um, he made a famous speech when the, you know, the Germans kept asking for more and more people to come to the camps he made. And there was one time when they wanted kids, uh, I think from eight to 10. Can you imagine that? Uh, and there are pictures of kids behind the fence and their mothers kneeling on the opposite side. And he did a famous speech, give me your children. So the Lotz ghetto was sort of, um, this huge ghetto where, where more and more people lived. And in the ghetto, uh, there actually were scribes, strangely, although I didn't think of that when I wrote the book. But there were scribes. There were people who were officially designated to say how great ghetto life was. And some of them were extremely famous writers in their, in their country, in their day. And there was one writer in particular named Oscar Rosenkrantz, who in addition to being a scribe, and I think this was true for most of the scribes, wrote a secret diary. That's how important that was. And Oscar Rosenkrantz emanated an amazing quality, an amazing quality of somehow in the middle of everything being able to see just the illuminated wonder of the world. It reminded me of how sometimes in extremely bad times, there is a way that the world gets stripped of meaning, of the meaning that we assign to it, and everything is just elevated in its clarity. So Oscar Rosenfeld stuck in my mind, and Asher Engelhardt was definitely a combination of those two. Uh, one of the other characters was a woman who spoke to me at the bottom of the mine 16 years before I wrote the book. I didn't know why she was talking, and I could hear her and I could see her, and it turned out that I made her into Ellie, who was head of the scribes. And I still really don't know where she came from. Um, at the time, I just discarded her voice. I thought, I, I don't write novels. I write true stories. But she became a very important person to me, and maybe she was some kind of gift, I don't know. And other characters just began to appear, uh, sort of out, of out of the woodwork, just like in what I read to you. Does that sort of answer it? My point is that 
the record keeping is, is a kind of novelistic thing, something we can look at. I'm not saying it was a good thing. It was not a, it was not a good thing then. It probably was, and the gypsies, of course, were massacred. Uh, and there's very little talk of that. Um, you know, they were, they were actually, there was a bunch of gypsies who were needed for a movie, and they were actually shipped out of Auschwitz, filmed in the movie, shipped back and gassed. So um, the only thing now about the record keeping is that one country, one Western power, has been forced to admit what they did. There, there are other kinds of powers, there are other Western powers who did not keep such public records. So it's not a good thing that they kept records. On the other hand, it, it has made it impossible for the Germans to deny what happened. Impossible for most Germans ever to deny. And I've actually seen Germans cry. Because all Germans, even during that time, were not Nazis. It's an absolute misnomer. Uh, just as one might assume that every American is for some of the wars going on. Um, so there were all kinds of people who worked for the resistance, who didn't work for the resistance, but didn't believe. There were people who didn't bother to salute. There were all kinds of people. But the, the next generation in particular um, has, has just has basically taken it to heart. Other thoughts, other questions? Um, what historical research did you have to do and what sources do you use? Wow, that's a good question. I mean, I'm really not, I, this is not a piece of historical fiction. You know, it's, it's, it's something that's imagined. It's something made up. Heidegger never got a letter from anybody. Um, <clears throat> so my research, I had to understand things that I had not wanted to bother to understand when I was taking history, you know, just sequence. Um, so I, that was pretty easy, you know, different battles. Uh, I began to read about a lot of um, the lies of sort of the people in charge of the Reich. I read Goebbels diaries. Uh, I read about a very interesting guy called Ernst Kassira who was head of the original secret police. And when he realized what was happening, he created a speedy secret police program for Jews to get out of the country. Uh, he had a way of doing that. And he was held in Auschwitz, and he was hung like maybe two days before the Allies or the Russians came. So I read a, a lot about a lot of people, a lot of the principles involved. I also discovered the main hypnotist for Hitler, Hanussen who was a fascinating person, uh, who predicted uh, Hitler's rise, um, who may have started the fire in the old government building, who was then shot. I read a lot about their interest in the occult. Um, I actually read, um, I, I mean, I read some pretty grisly books. Uh, there's one book, I can't remember the actual name of the person, but there was, I don't know if you want to know this, but there there was someone who was who was a Jewish doctor who was Mengele's assistant, and um, after the war, he the Allies invaded or the Russians invaded. I forget where exactly he when was at Auschwitz, um, but he 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 got out and he got home, and his house was there and his family was there. However. <laughs> um, he thought Mengele was a wonderful doctor. It was shocking. So it was very shocking to just read 
the various things that people thought, the unexpected things that people thought. I also, I, I, I read a book I would really recommend if you're interested in what was going on in Germany during World War II. It's called Frauen. It's by Alison Onings, who just wrote a book called Indian Voices. And what Alison did, uh, probably maybe 12, 13 years ago, was she interviewed a lot of women who had been present during the Second World War. And it was just fascinating to find out the various perspectives. So that's a book that I read very, very carefully. Um, somehow I think, and I think most writers would agree, I don't think I'm that special. Um, when you're interested in something, you find it and it finds you. And so I must have a shelf or books this, this many that are the research I did. And I also reread Heidegger. I was a philosophy major. And I read books about Heidegger and his particular kind of Nazism, which is a very kind of a romantic back to the land kind. Um, I read everything that seemed relevant. In much of your research, um, did you come across, I know you talked about the gypsies who were uh, executed. Did you come across any other groups? Because it's my understanding that in addition to six million Jews, there were an additional eight million non-Jews who were killed um, who comprised other groups. Can you speak on that a little bit? Sorry, you comprised of, yeah, in I mean, there were, In addition to gypsies, yeah. I understand there were seven-day Adventists and uh, yes. witnesses, and people of color like me, and, and Catholics. they made up in Catholics. Um, in your work, did you find any of this? Yeah. Find evidence of this. Oh, yes. I mean, there is a kind of a whole bunch of lost voices in the Second World War. The gypsies, the Catholics, of course, the resistance workers who were found, um, just people they didn't like, people who knew too much, uh, people who might know too much. But there was also a tremendous dislike of Catholics, especially. Uh, and, I mean, lots and lots and lots of people. And it's, 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 in, the, it's in the research, but not as much as one would think. You know, there's a, there's a section in which someone finds a letter um, that is written from her own district near Trier, and she feels like she could have known the person, passed them in the market. But she has to write something pretty rote. Every now and then, the scribes rebel. They're a rebellious lot. They play word games, and they fool around a lot. And every now and then, they will just feel compelled to write a real letter. And since no one is really checking on them, it's complete chaos in a way, uh, they do that. I do understand German, but I did not read the original text in German. I could not approach Heidegger in German. I mean, it's kind of a paradox. Heidegger has had more effect on philosophy, art, and architecture than any other thinker in the 20th century. An effect on postmodern thinking, incredible effect. And he had lots of students, Marcuse and Arendt. Um, so he's a paradox. He's, an, he's a really strange guy because um, his, his life was not really like his philosophy. <laughs> His life was, he was very rooted long before World War II in the romantic idea of Germany. The Treaty of Versailles really got the Germans, you know, wanting their fatherland back. 
And there was a romanticism in Germany that existed long before World War II. So Heidegger uh, built himself an alpine hut, a genuine alpine hut in the Black Forest. He would wear later hose into class in warm weather and a ski suit in cold weather. And um, he claims never to have known what the Nazis did, and he actually resigned from the Nazi party because it made him angry, but he never publicly renounced it. Very strange. But Heidegger's philosophy, interestingly, for someone who rooted himself in so much paraphernalia, rooted his identity in so much, his philosophy was quite different. His philosophy was very, very based on the idea that we give meaning to the world, and at times, the meaning falls away. We've all had times like that, when you're suddenly looking at something as if you were a primitive person and didn't know what it was for, or when you heard a word pronounced over and over and it had no meaning. And Heidegger called these moments falling out of the world, falling out of the world. And uh, another strand of his philosophy, which is related to that, is that we don't fall out of the world that often because we don't want to face death. He talks about being a sort of a constant thrownness towards death and away from it. And we kind of know we're going towards it. So I thought, you know, this is like totally ironic. Heidegger had a great influence on me. I was a philosophy major in philosophy of science, and he was the first non-philosopher of science I'd read. But uh, I thought this is really ironic. This is a man who really understood what it was like to sort of have nothing, to just have one of those moments of utter disorientation and fear and awareness of how fragile meaning, meaning is. And yet, he was in a situation in which there were people in camps who actually had fallen out of the world all the time. I mean, your consciousness in a concentration camp was very different. You were always thinking about death. You, you couldn't be thrown away from it. Uh, nothing had familiar meaning. The concentration camps were kind of a bizarre and ghoulish meditation on death and on falling out of the world. So I use that theme a lot. And of course, Heidegger's glasses has many, many meanings. What did the guy really see, even though he wanted his glasses very badly? But the idea of falling out of the world just seems absolutely to apply to times of war, uprising, and even times in one's own life when something really catastrophic happens and things don't have meaning anymore. So yes, I used it throughout the book, but as a sub-theme. I mean, I wasn't going to write you know, a treatise on philosophy. Um, but I read a lot about Heidegger. There's a book called Heidegger's Hut with photographs of his alpine hut. Um, uh, there's a book called Heidegger's Children. Uh, there's a lot of stuff about Heidegger. He's still a very enigmatic figure. So I think that's, you know, we have time maybe for one more question. Um, I haven't gotten the burning question, which is, is it okay to write about the Holocaust? Um, there are writers who think that it's not okay, that you're sort of sponging off sensationalism. I, I happen to think that because of its qualities, it's a very, very important period to keep going back to, that we can learn a lot from it. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>